Hello and welcome to the Wolf SSL live webinar, The Power of Testing in Embedded Software, presented by Wolf SSL engineer Andras and a code secure VP of Global Solutions Engineering, Mark. My name is Shizuka and I'll be moderating this webinar. All attendees will be only this mode. On, on this mode, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box. We will host a Q&A session following the presentation. The webinar will also be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. I invite you to follow us on Twitter at WolfSSL as well as our other socials. Also, feel free to email us if you have any additional question. And now I would like to give a brief company overview before we move to the technical presentation. Today, Wolf SSL secure over 2 billion connections. We have more than 1,000 OEM customers and that's of the sellers. Wolf SSL is made up of over 50 dedicated employees, most of which are engineers. This progress is, of course, supported by a strong partner network that we are proud of. Since the beginning, our engineering team has developed several embedded security products, including Wolf Clipped with DO170A support, HIP certification and the HIPS ready offering, MQTT up to the V5 specification, SSHB2, TPM 2.0, a secure bootloader known as a Wolf Boot, as well as Java wrappers and JSSC support and commercial support for Coral. All of these offerings are accompanied by through maintenance and support plans up to the 24-7 level. We also offer full service consulting. Code Secure, formerly the products division of Grammatech, is a leading global provider of application security testing solutions used by the world's most security conscious organization to detect measure, analyze, and resolve vulnerability for software they develop or use. Code secure products enable rapid DevSecOps development while also securing their software supply chain. You can find Code Secure at www.codesecure.com and follow them on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube at Code Secure. Now, let's turn our attention to the agenda for the webinar. We start with introduction, followed by, followed by an in-depth overview of Wolf SSL. This section will cover our products, application, and testing methods. Following that, the code secure team will present how static analysis saves time. This segment will cover coding standards, security testing procedures, and real-world examples. Finally, we'll wrap it up with a brief summary of our key takeaways. And now I would like to turn it over to Andras and Mark to talk about the power of testing in embedded software. Hi, thank you Suzuka for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Andras Fekete. I'm one of the uh, software engineers at Wolf SSL. And uh, I want to uh, give a brief overview of uh, what kinds of products and services that Wolf SSL can provide. So Wolf SSL, as you can see, was founded in uh, Bozeman, Montana in 2004. Uh, so we're a pretty uh, reasonably uh, old company. Uh, we have uh, many customers as well as uh, uh, what we do is we provide secure connections uh, for uh, embedded as well as server-side uh, products. So uh, next slide, please. So we have numerous uh, uh, technology partners, as you can see here, uh, pretty uh, well-known, recognizable companies, um, ranging from, as I mentioned, embedded all the way up to uh, larger processor uh, systems. So we, we spend the whole entire gamut and, and uh, um, support many of these platforms. Go to the next. Uh, but we also, uh, since Wolf SSL is a um, open source 
uh, company, we have all of our uh, source code up on uh, GitHub available. And we partner with uh, other open source community uh, projects uh, to ensure uh, compatibility. And uh, uh, we have a good cooperation with, uh, with these, these um, uh, partners listed on this slide. Next. So uh, what does Wolf SSL do? So we have uh, put out these three areas of uh, focus that uh, that's what you want to um, consider here. So the first is the simplest um, in, in terms of explanation uh, is, is uh, securing your data at rest, whether that is on some uh, storage device or some some place where where you're keeping your storage, uh, your data on storage, so away from prying eyes. That is with our product uh, called WolfCrypt that provides uh, cryptography. We also have uh, Wolf SSL as a product which uh, provides security for your data in transit. So that means um, using SSL and TLS for your connections between uh, between sites, as well as uh, an implementation of a SSH client, as well as server, we, we offer that as well. Our library is uh, um, rather transfer agnostic. So uh, you, can, you can use uh, your usual TCP and UDP, but you can also use other things like Bluetooth, uh, serial, uh, CAN bus, generally what, whatever you can imagine uh, we can support. And lastly, uh, in our product uh, portfolio, we have firmware updates. So uh, that involves things like uh, uh, TPMs, trusted platform modules, um, which encompasses also a secure boot and just making, making your firmware be uh, signed, verified, authenticated and um, uh, to make sure that you're you are running uh, on your devices what you in, uh, intended to run. The next. Uh, so uh, in more detail, uh, here's here's all of our products. So we have, as I mentioned, we have uh, Wolf SSL, which encompasses Wolf Crypt, our crypto module. Uh, Wolf Crypt is also um, uh, FIPS certified, so uh, you can you can get a FIPS certified version of uh, WolfCrypt if that is something that is of interest to you. We are in the process of getting our 140-3 certification. Um, we're pretty far along on that. And uh, for uh, other government or non-government agencies, the DO-178 uh, for uh, aviation uh, that is that is an important thing so we also support that as well as um, uh, asynchronous crypto callbacks we have a, uh, a lightweight mqtt client that uh, we support as well as the mentioned wolf ssh uh, client and server and we're actively developing and working on uh, wolf tpm and wolf boot uh, so the secure bootloader and a um, uh, TPM library. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is our uh, Wolf Sentry. So that's our uh, embedded intrusion detection and prevention system. So uh, nowadays with more and more IoT devices and just devices in general getting on the internet, especially when you consider thread-based devices, which uses IPv6, uh, it's more important to uh, get intrusion detection and uh, for your um, um, IoT devices to to reduce the chances of getting uh, hacked or or um, malware spread through it. We also are uh, producing uh, updates to curl and um, and tiny curl, and we provide the various. Uh, wrapper environments. So you can see here uh, numerous Java environments, uh, C Sharp, Python, and JavaScript wrappers as well. Next. And best yet, uh, so we are dual licensed. So 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, Wolf SSL is open source, so uh, you can use it as uh, as long as you um, uh, abide by the open source license, which means you have to share the source code and so on. Uh, but you can also uh, reach out to our sales and marketing team at uh, sales at wolfssl.com and uh, we can discuss uh, licensing of our commercial uh, products. Wolf SSL owns all of the copyright to all of the code, so there's no third party uh, licenses that you would need to get. Next. So let's dive a little bit deeper talk about some of the features of Wolf SSL. Uh, so namely, it, uh, all the libraries are written in C and that uh, gives us the best way to uh, afford portability. As, as I mentioned, we do from server to embedded, uh, you have a wide range of things and uh, function calls that you need to be able to support. And so um, C has given us the ability for, for making uh, that easier. Our library is uh, highly configurable so that you can uh, enable or disable uh, particular features and functionality uh, very easily. Uh, we have uh, numerous ways to uh, tune our library for, for speeding up, uh, be it with either hardware crypto uh, or um, um, some math libraries which, which have um, assembly optimizations in it as well. Uh, we have ways to switch around such that uh, if you have a constrained device with a small stack or low memory, uh, uh, we can we can support ways of still being able to run various cryptographic functions even on a much more constrained device. Uh, on top of all this, we also have a OpenSSL compatibility layer. What this means is that if you have already OpenSSL in your product, uh, but uh, maybe you're using uh, OpenSSL v1.1 uh, or 0 or 2, which has been end of life, uh, you can use our uh, WolfCrypt uh, engine and uh, use our compatibility layer to keep that in, in part of your uh, product and, and continue moving forward. Uh, next. So this is a, a little graph about how that all ties together. So for uh, 1.x versions of OpenSSL, you can use Wolf Engine, and then the newer uh, OpenSSL with 3.x is uh, using the Wolf Provider framework, uh, both both running uh, WolfCrypt underneath, which as I mentioned, is uh, FIPS certified. Uh, next. So um, just wanted to give a quick overview of all the various uh, functions and algorithms that we uh, support. So um, you can see here, it's uh, quite an extensive list. I'm sure I've, I've missed a couple on this list, but if you look at the source uh, on GitHub, you will uh, possibly find the ones that you're looking for. And if not, uh, we can also work with you to get those implemented. Uh, next. So I mentioned, you know, all the way from server class to desktop, you know, Windows, Linux, Mac uh, support for Wolf SSL, as well as uh, iPhone and Android and numerous um, RTOS and, and embedded systems uh, are, are available with, uh, with the use of um, Wolf SSL. Next. So I mentioned some uh, hardware support. This is um, um, hardware optimizations for various uh, cryptographic functions and functionality. Uh, you can see here we support uh, uh, various mm -hmm. Intel uh, hardware accelerations. And from uh, ST, uh, micro microchip and Infineon, they uh, we support their some of their TPMs as well in our uh, Wolf TPM and Wolf Group products. And next, so some more hardware. Um, uh, so 
you can see here uh, some more embedded processors like uh, NXP for scale and uh, uh, Nordic Cavium. Um, and as I mentioned before, we do have some assembly speedups of um, various platforms. Next. So this uh, is our uh, Wolf SSL rainbow of testing. Uh, our testing is uh, pretty exhaustive and uh, we'd like to say that we're the best tested SSL crypto library available. And uh, I am a firm believer of that, uh, seeing as how our testing infrastructure is set up, uh, we can easily make that clean. Uh, we, we run things like uh, fuzzers and uh, uh, various kinds of compilers, whether it be esoteric or pretty standard and running on uh, multiple different kinds of hardware platforms, operating systems. Uh, we've run uh, regression testing and uh, cipher suites and uh, memory leak checks, as well as um, static analysis. One of the uh, big things for us is having uh, uh, code peer reviews. So uh, nothing is committed to our repository that hasn't seen two sets of eyes on it. So engineers don't merge their own code in, in plain English. Uh, next. So just more of a detail on this, uh, on the testing matrix. So as you can see here, we do um, unit testing uh, on the API, as well as uh, Cypher Suites, um, um, testing out the algorithms. And we use this, uh, multiple static analysis tools, um, uh, namely the ones from our uh, partner here, Code Secure, as well as Code Variety. And uh, um, we use Valgrind for um, uh, detecting memory errors like memory leaks. And uh, we also use the uh, F sanitized tools as well. Uh, and and uh, again, um, just a multitude of fuzz testing solutions to make sure that uh, even if you put garbage data in, uh, you still have a safe way out of our API. Next. So why, why does all this testing matter? Uh, all these vulnerabilities can uh, leak your, your sensitive data, like uh, credit card information, uh, personally identifiable information, uh, all these things. And uh, nobody wants that on the internet. We want to lower the bar to make it uh, easy to get in to a safe way of providing cryptographic tools to our uh, customers and users. And just a fun fact, uh, it was reported that cybercrime is set to cost the global economy over $10 trillion in the next few years. Insane. So we want to uh, help uh, prevent against that. Uh, next. So, uh, we have made it our mission to be the uh, leader of the SSL TLS uh, library pack. As I mentioned, uh, we always put two sets of eyes on each line of code. Uh, we don't really have any secrets other than you know the ones that are secret keys and things like that. Uh, but all jokes aside, uh, we don't keep any secrets in our um, standard of code. Where uh, it's easy to review and critique our code. Uh, we use uh, relationships within the community with uh, researchers or uh, private entities that, uh, that are regularly plugging away and turning on our, uh, our code to make sure that it is uh, as secure as it can be. And we encourage all, uh, all feedback from amateurs to professionals. Uh, so um, next. So implementation bugs are frequently a source of vulnerabilities and we work hard to protect our users. Wolf SSL invests many hours of critique and review to making our code easy to read. 
We provide hundreds of examples and free pre-sales customer support to help ensure that our code is used properly. Uh, Wolf SSL creates tests specifically designed to protect against user error. We place sanity checks throughout the source to detect improper use and safeguard against implementation bugs. Next. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of the like life cycle of uh, feature and features and developments that we do at uh, Wolf SSL. So uh, starting at around the top right on this image, uh, the engineer has a feature set that they want to implement. So they take a branch of the GitHub master repository, they work their changes, they uh, they develop their code. There, there are some uh, pre-commit checks that our repo has to, to uh, alleviate some of the silly gotchas. And uh, then once they are all ready to go, they submit a pull request, which then triggers both a Jenkins job as well as a GitHub Actions uh, workflow as well. Both of those do separate tests. And uh, so you can even see on our GitHub repository what kinds of uh, GitHub actions that we perform. Our Jenkins tests are more in-house. Um, uh, they're mo much more exhaustive and extensive. And uh, it tests on various platforms and hardware. Once all the tests complete and successfully pass, uh, then it is passed on to a uh, another engineer to review the code. Once the review is uh, successful and passed, then that other engineer uh, will then merge the code uh, in, into, into the repository. So on uh, once, once the code is put into the master repo, we're still not done. Because at night, we have um, a nightly Jenkins test that runs even more fuzzers, more static analysis tests, uh, more memory leak checks, more sanitizers, and thousands more configurations. Uh, we, we also check for uh, uh, FIPS compatibility and make sure we haven't broken anything there. We, we add a couple more esoteric compilers and operating systems as well. Uh, next. So in a quick summary, I recommend you to try out Wolf SSL today. You can download it from our website or clone it from our GitHub repo. And you can always e easily get support at uh, support at wolfssl.com. So, thank you. And then over to you, Mark. Thanks very much, Andras, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation as well, Suzuka. Um, so thanks, everybody. My name is Mark Hermling. My presentation will be a little bit higher level than, than Andras. Um, I'm the VP of Global Solutions Engineering at Code Secure, formerly the product division of Grammatech. And um, I'm going to kind of hook up my presentation here uh, to, to what Andras is saying. Um, one of the statements that uh, I've heard a couple of times from Wolf SSL is that best to test it. SSL, TLS, and crypto av technology available today. That was a, a, attractive. I've been talking to a few of Wolf SSL um, people at various different conferences. And hey, if this is the best tested, we'd like a challenge to see if we can find any defects. So can we find defects in this open source Wolf SSL code base? Um, and uh, I'll in this presentation, I'll walk you through. I will qualify this as well saying, the code base is really, really good. So yes, we found a few defects. We're working with Wolf SSL people to, to get those addressed, and some of them already have addressed. They've been really, really responsive. Um, but yes, uh, so we're from Code Secure. I'm going to kind of connect with um, Andras's lifecycle overview on the, on the next slide, please, Suzuka. Um, so yes, we can. We can find things, and, and I'll walk you through some of those uh, some of those findings. So next slide, please. So the goal really is detection and prevention, right? Um, and if you look at Andras's diagram at the left-hand side, it's, it's really detection of bugs on, on, on bigger um, code bases, right? So now you're doing more like regression testing. 
And at the right-hand side is where really where the developer is. Well, what we're doing right now with Wolf SSL is that we're much more working on that left-hand side, right? Where that load build is being done, when the, the changes are in nightly, um, we'll run additional tests uh, on the Wolf SSL code base and then provide that back um, to the Wolf SSL team. Um, but the real value of the technology that I'll be talking about today, which is static analysis, is, is shift left. Bring that defect detection earlier, right? If the one the developer is, is, is taking a defect or, or implementing a new feature to run static analysis directly on that code and find bugs before it has to go into um, uh, unit testing and, 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 and regression testing, detect bugs where they're introduced. Uh, and that's typically what, what I spend a lot of time uh, working with my customers on, um, helping them to detect bugs as early as possible. And our customers are in many of the same applications as you find Wolf SSL. Um, our partners are the same partners. So the, the, the hardware platforms, the compiler vendors, um, we're all in the embedded uh, or, or like product technology field, right? When you're looking at automotive and industrial, medical, aerospace and defense, um, and that's where um, we shine. Um, so uh, well, what I'll show you here today is, is introducing static analysis in that workflow. Uh, I'll give you some warnings. We'll look at some warnings and we'll talk a lot about easy developer workflows because that's, that's really important. But before I go in there, next slide, please. I'll talk to you about who we are. So we are product security experts. Um, Code Secure is a split off from a company called Gramatech that you may have heard of. So we uh, were acquired a couple of months ago uh, by Battery Ventures, which is a, a private equity firm that um, invests a lot into software companies. Um, and Gramatech before that has done a lot of research for uh, the US government, the DOD, and um, typically research around programming, understanding programming models, understanding binaries, understanding source code, and then in general application security testing solutions. And, and where you find that we differentiate ourselves is that we push boundaries and, and we have really good um, detection capabilities of vulnerabilities around uh, embedded uh, safe and secure type of applications. We're embedded experts, as I said, all of the, uh, the, the type of applications and our, our tosses and cross compilation environments and hardware environments uh, that Andras talked about, our products can meet as well, uh, which, is, which is really, really neat. The examples that I'll give here uh, are a bit um, more on the simpler side. I've compiled everything with uh, GCC on Linux, uh, but if you wanted to grab a Tasking compiler or an IAR compiler or a Kyle compiler, um, or Green Hills compiler, or you you name it for um, NXP, Renaissance, or um, ST Micro type of um, platform, that all works as well. Next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of, of geographies and, and type of customers, um, here's a couple of names that you, that you may be familiar with. You'll see a really good uh, split between uh, automotive, uh, defense, um, we have, uh, as a joke around, usually we have 100% uh, market share on the planet Mars. So all of the Mars devices were tested with our tools, including the, the Mars helicopter. Uh, medical, you see here, pure storage does um, uh, storage, large storage systems. Um, so what you find here is that people that have highly technical code bases um, are our customers. Um, from North America through Europe to, um, to Asia and, and, and Australia. Next slide, please. So what do we provide to these customers? Well, that's kind of interesting. We, we have three different lenses that we look at uh, the safety and security market. I'm going to start at the left-hand side here, uh, which was what we call DevSecOps, right? So this is doing testing as Andras explained as early as possible in the software development lifecycle. So treat software security as a first level attribute. All of our customers have to do uh, typically safety and security. You can't have safety without security, right? If you are building anything that has functional safety requirements, if you don't pay attention to your security, then that safety can be violated. So what we use for that is our Code Sonar product. Our Code Sonar is, is the product I'll talk about today, and it performs static application security testing or static analysis on your source code. And I'll go a little bit deeper as to what I mean with that, because static analysis is a simple term but has lots of um, complex underlying technologies. 
And all the way on the right-hand side of this little Venn diagram, you see a product called Code Sentry. Code Sentry is a new product that we've introduced uh, about three, four years ago, and it does binary composition analysis. So think about this. You have a piece of software in production-ready form. So maybe it's a binary, maybe it's a zip file, could be firmware, could be a, an application that you download to a, an, an embedded device, and you want to know what open source software was used in it, what people typically call a software bill of material. Code Sentry can do that at the end of the software development lifecycle. So you don't have to look at the source code, it can do it from binary, it can take in your code, your RTOS vendor's code, your Bluetooth vendor's code, and look at that entire binary and say, hey, you have Wolf SSL version uh, X in there, you have a USB driver, you have this operating system, uh, and you um, have libjpeg, for example, if it has anything to do with graphics. So Code Sentry can do that from that software supply chain security perspective. And we see that both software consumers and software uh, producers are really, really interested in this. So software producers, because we can easily create that SBOM, and software consumers, because you don't know what version, for example, if you're familiar with the latest uh, vulnerability that was in curl, do you know at what locations you have curl in your uh, code base and, and whether your code base is vulnerable, yes or no? Which of course leads the middle part of that uh, Venn diagram. And that's kind of the blend between DevSecOps and software supply chain. And these are typically security teams in larger companies that get deliverables from internal teams and have to kind of put their stamp of approval on it before they ship it out. And they use a blend of code sentry to generate that SBOM and then code sonar to look at the results uh, and, and see whether best practices uh, have been uh, used and whether the right warnings have been addressed or not. So that's what we do. Uh, those are the products that we provide, code sonar and code sentry. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is kind of a, a little summary slide as well, if you don't have uh, the story in, in, in your head anymore. So Code Sonar, really the purpose is DevSecOps with safety, quality, and security. So detect problems in your source code. And that's what we'll look at today. Code Sentry really is that uh, binary composition analysis. So secure code at the end of the process. So generate software bill of materials at the end of the process. Both of these products, the, the, the thought behind it is that we provide deep detection of whatever it is we're searching for, right? Problems on the left-hand side, SBOM on the right-hand side. And then we provide extensive information as to why we think that these things are a problem. And that's what absolutely what you'll see today when we start looking at, uh, at CodeSonar. Next slide, please. So this is what we're doing. So you saw uh, on the last slide, um, uh, we follow the nightly snapshot branch of Wolf, Wolf SSL. And if, if we see any um, uh, changes, we run static analysis uh, on that branch, uh, and then we uh, provide the results back to the Wolf SSL team. And we do that with two different uh, mindsets. Um, it's, it's a mindset of detecting problems in the existing code base. That's really what we're working on right now. Uh, and then going forward, uh, we're looking at Delta. So if there's new code that comes in, what new type of vulnerabilities have been introduced in that code? Can we kind of, can we kind of flush them out quickly? Or vulnerabilities that, that are on the boundary between this new code and the old code. So we do this on Wolf SSL, as I said. We also do this on a, a couple of other open source projects. Um, and if you're interested, uh, I'm, I'm continuously adding more projects to our list. If you have a favorite open source project that you'd like to add and that you'd like to run uh, CodeSonar on, let me know. What we're using for this analysis is our CodeSonar hybrid SaaS, SaaS instance, which is quite the mouthful. Um, but CodeSonar, I'll come back with on this a couple of times in this presentation, is extremely flexible. Many of our customers in the embedded space, especially let's say automotive or, or defense, prefer to run all of their tools in-house. We call that on-prem, on-premise. So they have their own servers, their code base is there, and they run all their tests on their code base inside of their network. Um, there's also an air-gapped option, meaning it's not just on the network. The network is completely air-gapped uh, from other networks. So if you're deeply in 
to uh, secret or highly classified uh, defense applications, we can support that with CodeSonar. What we're using for this collaboration is our software as a service version of CodeSonar, exact same software that runs um, on an Amazon cloud that we host and that we can get lots of people access to. So the Wolf SSL team has access to this static application security testing software as a service host. And we call it hybrid because if you think of static analysis, uh, you're really you're looking at the source code, you're doing that somewhere, you're, you're performing compute somewhere to find problems in that source code, and then you store the results somewhere. All of these th three phases can be anywhere. Uh, in the collaboration right now, um, the build runs on a Kubernetes cluster that I run in my basement, uh, coincidentally, uh, using standard GitHub runners. So the GitHub runner grabs a container, uh, does the, the build, and, and then send the, uh, the compute is also done local. Uh, I could do it in the cloud, but currently it's done local. And the results are stored in the cloud. And that last step is really, really nice because now you can collaborate on these result sets. And I can look at an, I, I can look at a particular warning, send it to Andras and the team and say, hey guys, I think this is um, something of interest. What do you guys think? And all of our warnings have a lot of, uh, of additional information so that people can actually understand what the static analysis tools are saying. Because what's important with static analysis is not saying, hey, there's a buffer overrun on line 13 in file a.c. That doesn't help. Um, well, it helps a little bit, but, but what helps a lot more is if you say file a.c is called from b.c and c.c and this path through the source code triggers this buffer overrun. That's the type of warnings that you'll see in the example that I'll put up in a little while. Next slide, please. So typically, that's what happens. So typically, customers integrate CodeSonar into DevSecOps workflows. And we integrate into technically everything. Um, I should have put Azure on this list as well. But GitHub, GitLab, Garrett, Bitbucket, Clearcase, SVN, RCS, whatever you have uh, where you store uh, your code base, we can do Jenkins, we can do um, a whole bunch of, uh, of, of various different uh, DevSecOps workflows with that. And, and then we provide, CodeSonar provides two different important things, and people sometimes miss that second part. So CodeSonar provides coding standard enforcement. So coding standard enforcement, that's what we talk about, MISRA, right? Uh, the, the coding standard, very popular in automotive, joint strike fighter, cert C, C++. There's a a handful, a couple of handfuls of these. And these tests are usually pretty, pretty simple, right? They, they are things such as um, if you define a macro, you have to use it. If you uh, use a variable name, make sure that there's not a deeper context that hides that variable name. Use your type desk, those type of things. Uh, and they're really good rules. It's basically a coding standard. We can enforce it. But what CodeSonar also does is deep detection of undefined behavior. And that's really where we find the big value. And, and that's where I'll sh show you some of the examples here today. So this, the undefined behavior in standards such as C++ is, is everywhere, right? Everything from a null pointer dereference to a buffer overrun to use after free, which is extremely dangerous, specifically to what Andras mentioned, leaking sensitive data. Um, all of these things are, are, are really tricky. And, and then, as I said, scalable compute platforms, it's a wonderful time to be doing these type of things because you can do everything from powerful laptops to compute servers, uh, to uh, VS Code dev containers uh, to help your team find more problems sooner. Um, and if you want me to dive deeper into any of these, please feel free to see questions, send questions. I see some questions popping in, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, and um, um, happy to uh, answer them a little bit after the uh, after I'm done with my presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so the typical developer workflow, you heard Andras say the same thing, right? Uh, so there's a workflow where yeah, you, you clone the repo and that can be Wolf SSL or your fork of Wolf, Wolf SSL. You create a branch, you do some work, then you create a, a pull request or a merge request, depending what tool you use. And at that point in time, we can 
integrate CodeSona to start performing that scanning. If you prefer to do it um, before you create the merge request pull request, that's also very much um, a, a possibility, of course. So you can do it on your own desktop. Uh, and then you resolve the warnings before you can merge that back into um, the, the the master, uh, the, the main repository, I should say. And when you do that merge, you get these type of uh, pictures as you see on the right-hand side. Um, because static analysis is only good if it's used. If you don't use it, if you don't use the results, then you're just wasting a whole bunch of compute time. Um, we have to provide, provide the, the easy to use information to the developers, right? Developers, developers, developers are important here. So providing this information on the merge request, in VS Code, in your favorite IDE, on the command line, where you want is really what we're working on. And what you see here is something that we have not done with our Wolf SSL collaboration yet. This is a diff analysis. So basically here it says, I have a branch. I'd like to merge this branch back in. In this branch, I have one warning that is not on the main branch. That's not in the master repository. So I have to resolve this one warning uh, before I'm allowed to merge it back in. All these type of workflows, it's, uh, it's really uh, convenient to set up. Next slide, please. So quick feedback, coding cell violation, and then deep semantic bug finding. Th th those parts are really, really a crucial part of any testing program. If this is missing in your environment, uh, give us a call. We really scale well from like the typical automotive applications, which could be like 100,000 lines of code, uh, to aviation, which is typically less, to large industrial controllers uh, that can have hundreds of thousands or even multiple millions, to automotive IVI, which typically has 15, 20 million lines of source code. Um, we can scan all of that as long as you can scale your compute. Um, so deep semantic bug finding, cross procedure, cross compilation, you know, that finds that undefined behavior and things that really take time to find. Um, I was uh, talking to this um, this one customer and I asked him like, can you give me a great example of something that has saved you time with CodeSonar? And they said, absolutely. They had a, a, a regression test that was intermittently failing. Sometimes it would pass, sometimes it would fail. They spent two weeks trying to find what the issue was. And at the same time, they were evaluating static analysis tools and Godzona absolutely pointed straight at um, an uninitialized uh, variable, which of course can, can lead exactly to that type of uh, problem. So that was it. They fixed it and the, uh, the failure was gone. So those are the type of, of, of benefits that we can provide. So let me kind of go to the end of my, uh, my soapbox here. Next slide, please. The difference that we do is we integrate into that DevSecOps deep analysis and we explain problems in detail. And that's really convenient because that helps with the remediation, right? We don't just say, hey, there's a buffer overrun. We'll give you the path. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of an eye chart, uh, but I wanted to give you a bit of an idea. So lower left-hand side is where we start here. This is the type of English explanation that CodeSonar generates. And this is a snippet from Wolf SSL that the team has already fixed. So this is a buffer overrun uh, by one byte uh, that we found uh, after all the testing had done. Uh, so this is an example of where CodeSonar digs really, really deep to find these type of, of challenges. So coding is not my, my, my forte, but what's happening here really is we've got input, which is a variable and a capacity of 121 bytes, but IDX plus two uh, is bound above by 121. So you're in index 121 of a 121 uh, array, that's you're reading outside of that buffer. That can be um, uh, sensitive data that leaks. Now it's one byte. You can kind of say, oh, gee, it's only one byte, but that's where it starts, right? So keeping track of those things is really, really important. Then at the lower right-hand side um, is what we call our info window. So as you, you look at a piece of code base and you move your mouse pointer around, if you hover over, any artifact, a function, um, a variable, local or global, this info window will provide you with the global information of that particular attribute. So in this case, I, I hovered over something called DER, which is a, an example as a variable in that um, code snippet where this problem was. And it tells me it's a local variable and tells me exactly where it was read and where it was written. 
Uh, now this is again, this is a local variable. So it's typically within the scope of a function. But if this is a global variable, it actually tells me that over the wider program. And then the last point that you see at the bottom here, it says DER is tainted. So data taint is something that we that goes on a tracks throughout the program. And it is data that has flown from outside of the system to inside of the system. And it's not properly being uh, cleared. So data taint means, hey, data has come in. If you would use DER in an access to an array, you're using tainted data to index into an array, which of course we all know uh, is something that you want to avoid. Then looking at that, that box from the lower left, if you look at the, the top, um, you see two pictures, the left picture at the top, um, you see this tan background. Uh, this is the code path. So this is the path through the source code that would trigger that buffer overrun. The functions here, I know you can't read the text, uh, but these are functions from different compilation units or different C files that code sonar kind of calculates through and tells you, hey, if this path happens, you could be exposed. And what we very often see is the difference between the happy paths and the error path. So if you look at the, the code, you see specific areas that are, that are white. Those are conditionals that were false, right? So maybe um, you have a um, an enumeration and uh, you cover off two variables in the enumeration, but not two options for the enumeration, but not the third one. CodeSonar computes through those cases and tells you, hey, wait a second, if you go through the third option, this will lead to uh, insert your favorite um, undefined behavior bug. Um, so that's what that, that top diagram gives. Of course, in your screen, you can actually read the text. And then on the upper right-hand side is one of my favorites. This is a call graph. So it tells you through what functions you can reach this problem. So you can see a whole bunch of different uh, paths through the source code that trigger this function. And that gives you an idea as to uh, how widespread this problem is, uh, how problematic it is, and, and, and what type of resources you should put on, on fixing it, besides the fact that you should always fix a buffer overrun. So next slide, please, my last slide. Um, so that's the example that I want to kind of walk through. So buffer overrun, very heavily path-based. Uh, you'll see that in CodeSonar everywhere. Um, and those are tricky problems to resolve. Uh, another one that we're looking at here is a negative character value. And this is uh, important for the type of uh, platform that Wolf SSL is running on multiple different operating systems. Some operating systems um, use um, specific functions such as is a number um, and implement it with a, with a table. So if you have a negative value into a table, a uh, negative character value in the table, you have a kind of a buffer or under run, right? Uh, so those type of warnings are flagged. In Linux, it's not as much of a problem, but under that listed a whole bunch of resource constraint devices um, and, and, and that can be a problem. So these, these type of warnings are all there. Everything that you would expect from an embedded static analysis tool, you'll, you'll find. And then the last one here, this is just a quick high level overview uh, that we're still reviewing about a bunch of warnings. There's a whole bunch of uh, redundant conditions in here. Uh, which of course is not necessarily a big problem, right? Uh, but it, it could point to a misunderstood code. It could also point to defensive coding. Um, and, and you can see here that it very rapidly dies down to single or, or low code uh, instance count warnings. And CodeSonar is, is ultimately configurable. If you don't care about redundant conditions, you can turn that warning off. And then of course it, it filters everything out of, uh, out of your results set. So that's kind of the, the 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 story that I wanted to share here. If you can switch to the last slide, please, Suzuka. Um, that's what we wanted to put, to point out for you. Wolf SSL, a very powerful, well tested, embedded SSL TLS crypto solution, cross platform, cross compiler, extremely well tested by them and and others in the industry. Uh, static analysis part of this. CodeSonar is is a, is a perfect alignment with a testing vision and provides deep cross-procedural cross-compilation unit analysis with powerful program visualization. That's one of the, the fun parts of, of going through warnings. So I hope that wasn't too much of a, of, of a sandbox, um, uh, soapbox story. Um, and um, I see some questions into the Q&A session. If you have more questions, feel free to send them. So let me pass it back to you, Suzuka. Thank you.
Um, uh, there's a question. If I would like to add a feature to Wolf SSL, would you accept a call contribution via a PR? Well, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the process is pretty simple. Um, open a PR, we'll review it, we we'll run our checks. Uh, we'll have you sign a uh, contributor agreement to make the lawyers happy, and that's it. Pretty simple. And there is another question. What is your take on the trend in the security industry to use Rust or even formal languages like App? So Rust is a neat language that is supposed to provide various code safety promises. Uh, I think it has a lot of potential, though from my understanding, it also introduces some bloat, uh, but definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah, and from our side as well, uh, absolutely. Um, the problem with uh, many of the languages that we uh, use today, right, is they're extremely powerful, extremely lean, which is why we like them. Um, because we can reduce memory and processor and power usage and all that type of stuff. Um, but they're also unsafe. Um, so we certainly see uh, Rust and, and other languages uh, come up from a code secure perspective. We're certainly following them, right? It's important to provide um, people with the tools to develop in these languages, but I don't see them much in uh, embedded systems just yet, specifically if you need anything that has to do security or safety, uh, it, it, they're not quite tested to the same level as the as the existing technologies and operating environments. Good question. And there's another question: Does the code century only cover open source components, or is there any level of, level of coverage for closed source components? Great question. Um, so, code century is initially focused on, on, on open source components, so very well uh, observed. Um, and, and there's a follow-on question here as well, um, like how can we do libraries and, 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 and ports of libraries? Um, Code Sentry though does connect with some um, commercial components as well, and we're, we're extending that. The problem with commercial components is that a lot of that is third-party code that may not be, um, just generally available just yet, right? Which makes it really hard for us to scan. Uh, we do connect with like, um, let's say free RTOS and Wolf SSL, those type of uh, mixed uh, mode type of uh, ports or, or components. We do Windows as well. Um, but in general, we're, we're mainly focused um, uh, to that. Now, as you have ports, like if somebody has a, a port uh, of let's say Wolf SSL to ARM, we absolutely would, uh, connect with that because what what code what code sentry does is it looks for the amount of signal uh, and and if you have the the core wolf SSL um, functionality is, is is the same functionality in ARM versus um, um, Intel yes the 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 hardware abstraction layer is different and the, and some of the the encryption functions will be different but there's still a lot of signal around so you would we would detect that even if it is on a an ARM or um, uh, what else? I saw a Cavian platform. Uh, we would still detect that. So yeah, we we actually have really good success in finding these components across process architectures. Um, Code Century really is uh, um, well suited to to throw some fir firmware at it and and see um, what you find. Keeping in mind though that the lower that you go to the hardware, the less the typical amount of open source is, right? So we don't necessarily, if you have like a, a 20 kilobyte piece of firmware that does a bootloader, there may not be a lot of, uh, of open source in it. Um, sorry, that was a long, uh, long, long answer. Did you answer for this question and for open source components, how reliable is the coverage for ports and wrappers? Asking since the CV is disclosed in NV, NVDs, don't always assign the CPEs of ports and a wrapper that are also affected by port, uh, the vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, that's the so I, I, as I said, if you have the live um, Wolf SSL, you port it to another infrastructure, uh, and it may not be in the, in the NVD, but we bring it back to the main component. Uh, we also use 
uh, more sourcing than just the NVD. Uh, we have other sources of vulnerability information. Uh, happy to do a, a deeper dive, dive demonstration uh, if the, the the person is interested. Okay. And there's another question that's called Sentry offer academic licensing. We don't have academic licensing right now, but uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, at the email here below. Um, I'm sure that we can work something out if you have a binary that you would like an SBOM for. Um, happy to happy to see what, how we can work together. And there's another question. I'm interested in TLS. I'm the longest developer for the IBM OS slash two operating system, and it is strangled strangled because there is zero TLS support for IBM OS slash two. I'm developing a web program that needs TLS one point two support. So I'll take that. Um, uh, I think uh, I'd have to look into that. I'm not sure if we do, but uh, I think the best course of action for you is really to reach out to support at wolfssl.com and uh, we may have some uh, pointers that we can give you as to how you can um, incorporate WolfSSL into your, um, into your uh, development environment and tools. And there is another question, question for code secure. Are you using your own static code analyzer or do you bundle several static code analyzer together? Uh, another great question. We have our own. So this is our own engine. Um, we started code sonar is, is about uh, 15 plus years old. I don't meant to be honest. I'd have to look when the first release was out. Um, so we we have our own uh, engine. Uh, we observe the code as it is compiled for C and C++ at least. For Java and C Sharp, we can just look at the bytecode. But for C and C++, we observe compilation. So we see all of the inclusions. We parse the code the exact same way as, uh, as your compiler would parse it. We have a third-party parser that we use for that because parsing is hard, interestingly enough. Uh, and then we create a program model uh, that we then start to, to walk through um, we have 450 plus different tests that we run on it uh, that you can all turn individually on or off. And you can add your own uh, either in C, C++ for speed or in Python if you want to uh, quickly prototype. Um, so it's it's quite an extensive platform. There is another question. Support as an example of what would be needed to get C code compiling in IBM Visual AC last update in 1998? So uh, I hope the answer is very little. Um, as mentioned before, you know, we use numerous um, operating systems and compilers that we test against. And so um, uh, we also check to make sure that we have um, uh, C89 compatibility as well. Uh, so our code likely would, uh, I, I hope to say, just work. Um, uh, but that is something that I would have to uh, actually try. If there is no more questions, um... Thank you, Andras and Mark, for hosting an informative webinar, and everyone for joining the webinar. Please don't forget to follow us on Twitter at WolfSSL and at CodeSecure, as well as other socials. Thank you, guys. I thank you again, and see you next week. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Thank you.